Vanderbilt has many opportunities for research, for teaching, and for service. I feel like that's the beauty of Vanderbilt. It is the ability to bring people together. Um, no matter how old you are, no matter where you're from, you feel like you kind of belong here immediately. We start with the impossible so that we can get to innovation. If you don't think big and you just think small, that really just stands in the way of the work that can be done. I have been equipped for whatever my calling is. It just feels like once the way becomes clear, I will be ready to take those steps. I think what's so special about my Vanderbilt experience is that um, it's definitely shaped me into the person I am today and the lawyer I'm going to be. As soon as you walk through this door and you look around, you are filled with the feeling that anything here is possible. Good evening, I'm Tim Warnock, President of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association Board, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's State of the University event with Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer. Tonight, Chancellor Deermeyer will address the current state of Vanderbilt and his vision for Vanderbilt's future. Following his remarks, I will moderate a 20-minute question and answer session of pre-submitted and live questions from alumni and parents. To submit your question now, please use the Q&A feature. We'll try to meet, reach as many questions as we can. The last two years have been among the most challenging and the most defining in Vanderbilt's history. They brought us the COVID-19 pandemic, America's reckoning with racial justice, and devastating tornadoes in Middle Tennessee, among other once-in-a-lifetime events. And it just so happened that this time, time span coincided with the first years of Chancellor Deermeyer's leadership who assumed his role in July 2020 and was officially installed as Vanderbilt's ninth chancellor last month. Despite the challenges of the last several years, Chancellor Deermeyer has often described Vanderbilt's response to these events as our university's proudest moment. He's here with us tonight to share his view of where Vanderbilt is today and where it is going. Please join me now in welcoming Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer. Well, thank you, Tim. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with me uh, tonight uh, to spend a little time to talk about Vanderbilt. And uh, as Tim just mentioned, uh, these have been really intense, eventful, and challenging two years. Uh, but the good news is, is that the university is in much better shape uh, than it was uh, two years ago when the pandemic started. As a matter of fact, the university is arguably uh, in the best shape in its history. And that really is true. Um, no matter where we look at, um, on the financial side, um, for example, we are in a very strong position. Um, when we, uh, when uh, two years ago, when the pandemic started, uh, our endowment was around $6.7 billion, and then it went down, and now it's uh, over $11 billion. And we're strong from an operating performance point of view. So financially, we're in a very good position. Um, and then when we think about our students, we have the most accomplished most diverse student body in our history. Um, we have a record number of applicants. Um, on the undergraduate side, uh, we've never been more selective. Uh, and we have also never been um, more successful in making sure that the students come to Vanderbilt. Um, so the student body on the undergraduate side and really across our programs uh, is tremendous. And uh, again, this is a testament of, of all the work that went into getting through the last two years. And then on the faculty side, uh, we have been able to attract uh, a tremendous group of new faculty. Uh, we had a, a particular initiative on that, which we called Destination Vanderbilt, which was a $100 million investment that we started right in the middle of the pandemic in the fall to bring around 60 new faculty to Vanderbilt, a really exemplary faculty, and we were being able um, to do that with great success. So, uh, and that particularly has been true in areas that are highly competitive. So in computer science alone, uh, during the first year of this initiative, we were able to hire 11 new faculty, all with stellar records, and we're on track basically to doubling the size of the computer science department uh, within three years. Uh, so these are, these are all great accomplishments. And um, when we think about the state of the university, we're, we're in a much stronger position, as I said, than we were two years ago. And very few universities can say that. So uh, what, what happened and what 
were, were the drivers and the specific uh, decisions that we made during this period. I think the first and most important principle that really guides everything that we do, but that particularly guided our decision making during the pandemic was that everything that we do would be based on our mission, would be driven by our purpose as a university. So that meant when we had to decide um, in May uh, of 2020 whether we would bring our students back on campus and how that would be done, we didn't think about it from the point of view, should we go online or should we go in person? We went back to what our mission is, and our mission is to provide a transformative education for our students, and we strongly believe that a transformative education means being on campus together as a living learning community. So that meant then that we would do everything possible to bring our students back on campus, and our staff worked tireless hours to make that possible, our faculty, prepared not only for online classes, but also for in-person classes that it would be possible to move back and forth depending on what the particular public health situation was. And then our students really stepped up um, when it was necessary to do so. But we never wavered in our commitment to bring students back on campus. And we had 85% of our undergraduates on campus. Uh, we had the 15% that couldn't join us. Most of them were international students that couldn't come back to Nashville because of visa requirements. And then we had the majority of our classes in person. Again, tremendous amount of effort that went into that to literally turn every room on campus from the libraries to like the entry areas of the law school uh, into lecture halls so that we could maintain um, as safe an environment as possible while maintaining a commitment to in-person education. So the mission was really critical. And then on the faculty side, on the research side, our mission there is to create the environment for path-breaking research. And that meant, for example, when we were thinking about our biomedical faculty, that we needed to make sure that the labs are open as fast as we possibly could. And of course, during the early, particularly the early months of COVID, that meant we had to maintain physical distancing. And that meant that the capacity in the labs basically was reduced to 30%. So what our faculty did and what our staff did, they, they basically worked around the clock. I mean, literally our postdoc students and faculty brought beds, portable beds into carts into their labs, took hours, took, worked in shifts in order to be able to continue their work. And it's so gratifying and so impressive that many of the breakthroughs, the medical breakthroughs that now have helped us to deal uh, with COVID-19. Um, that includes the first antiviral medications, so you may remember remdesivir, antibody therapies, uh, clinical trials um, that were really, in, really important to getting um, the vaccine approved. All these breakthroughs happened in the first weeks or where the foundation was laid in the first weeks uh, when our faculty were able to go back to the labs and do their path-breaking work. So it took an enormous amount of effort to get there, but fundamentally everything we did there was driven by our sense of purpose and by, and by our sense of mission. And then um, we also, when we talked about it, when we communicated, and, when we, and, and how we thought about uh, dealing with those challenges, we didn't want to be limited by fear. So uh, you heard already, you know, Tim mentioned that, is that I look back at this, at this period as our proudest moment. And we started thinking about it right from the beginning. Uh, we, want, we wanted to make sure that as a community, we look back at these two years when we were tested and we were stepped up and when we wrote our own legacy. So that when 30, 40 years ago, we look back to this and talk, our grandkids about, talk to our grandkids about it, uh, we can look back to this period with a lot of pride where we as a community stepped up. And uh, what our community did uh, in, this, in these years, in these months, was really remarkable. So, how do we look forward now? Um, I think most importantly, we learned a couple of really key questions. So, or, uh, lessons, I would say. And so the first lesson, very clear, and you, 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 could, um, you couldn't have experienced it any clearer, that if we come together, as a community, faculty, students, staff, and we're driven and guided by a common purpose, and we're guided by 
a clear set of values, we can move mountains. And uh, the challenges were immense, but everybody stepped up. Our faculty, our staff, our students really did amazing, amazing things during this period. And, and, and I want to highlight how hard this was on the students. And we challenged the students um, to do more than we usually would ask them to do. And they're really, they're really were tremendous. So the experience for us to come together as a community, pull together, have a common purpose, and then see how when we work together and are dedicated to that, what that, what that can accomplish, that was a powerful lesson. Uh, the second um, powerful lesson that we learned as a university is that we can, that we can operate at, I'm going to call it, operate at a higher level of metabolism. So what I mean by that is that we had to make decisions much more quickly. Um, we had to act in an environment of tremendous uncertainty. We had to be able to be flexible. And we, we talked about this openly, is that we didn't know at the very beginning what the virus would do. We didn't know exactly what the challenges would be. And so it was very, very important for us to have a decision-making structure where we, would keep be, where we could be flexible, where our, our decisions were, were driven um, by the pub best public health information, the best science, and we had a tremendous partnership uh, with our partners in the in Vanderbilt University Medical Center in order to allow us to do it, but also be able uh, to be flexible and to change course uh, when we had to. To just give you one example, um, everybody thought at the beginning uh, that um, being in a classroom together was one of the biggest risks. And of course, we did physical distancing, and we you know, created all these kind of wayfinding areas. We literally had kind of one-way streets all over campus. You go into one door, and you come out the other door. And then we, we didn't have a single case of an infection in a classroom during the entire two years. Um, the bigger problem for us was really, how do we keep the virus out? Um, you know, when, when our students would go out or they would interact with the community. But throughout this entire period, Vanderbilt was always the safest place um, in Nashville um, because of all the tremendous work that went into that. But we had to adjust. We had to change. Um, the political environment changed. The legal environment changed. So being able to operate fast, agile, is an important lesson that we want to take forward with us. And then the last lesson, and arguably the most important one, is that we can confidently be ourselves. Uh, we don't have to look over our shoulders. Uh, we don't have to follow what other universities are doing. We have a lot of respect for our peers. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to imitate them. We can authentically uh, be Vanderbilt. And uh, we made a lot of decisions that were not where our peers were. I mean, when we invited all of our students back to campus, uh, we were one of the very few universities to do so. Um, when we decided to have most of our classes in person, we were one of very few universities to do so. When we decided to have athletics um, in the fall, we were one of the few universities to do so. Uh, the Ivy League, for example, shut down all athletic competition already in August. But the way we thought about this is, what's our mission? What's our purpose? And our purpose is to create an environment where our students and our faculty can realize their fullest potential. And that means for our student athletes that we want to create an environment where they can compete if they want to compete. And if they didn't want to compete, they had another year of eligibility and they were financially supported by us. But our students, our student athletes that wanted to compete, we would bend over backwards to make it possible for them to do so. And in partnerships with our colleagues at the SEC, that meant an enormous amount of difficulty to get this done. And how do you do this safely? How do you do testing? How do you deal with the, with the whole medical aspects of that? Um, but it was all driven by the sense, how do we create an environment where our student athletes can, can compete? And the same was true for our musicians. Because it's not so easy to practice your oboe uh, during COVID. So that required a lot of thinking, that required a lot of um, new solutions, the willingness to try out things and then adapt. But all of that was driven by a sense that we can chart our own path. 
And that sense of being uniquely Vanderbilt and have confidence in who we are will guide us as we think towards the future. So I just want to mention one aspect that is uh, certainly top of mind for me. Um, Tim mentioned my investiture, uh, which uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, five weeks ago. Uh, that, was that was postponed because of COVID as well. And so we were able to do it uh, um, in person and uh, as an opportunity for the community to come together and not only celebrate the transition from one chancellor to the next, but also as an, as an important moment for us to, to think about who we are, what makes us unique, and how do we take this sense of, of our own identity and then move forward. And one thing that is particularly important for me is that we are, we are clear about that and that our decisions are based on that. As I said before, our mission, our purpose, our sense of who we are at Vanderbilt should really drive what we do. So what are these beliefs? Well, one of the important ones I mentioned already, we are a community that is dedicated that, that our students and our faculty can realize their full potential. And we believe firmly that this is best done in a community that's supportive and challenging. So it's a little bit like a team. It's hard to make the team. We want you to be the best possible athlete that you can be. And we want you to be part of a team that supports you and challenges you. And a crucially, crucially important component is that, particularly for our students, that there's an environment where our students feel that they can engage with complex topics, that they can struggle with difficult challenges, uh, with ideas uh, that go against the grain, that may challenge conventional wisdom. And that means for us that we need to have an environment where we're fully committed towards free expression and a sense of civil discourse among the members of our community. And for those of you that follow higher ed, uh, there are a lot of controversies um, that are going on all over, uh, all over the country. Sometimes these threats to um, free expression and civil discourse come from the outside, and sometimes they come from inside uh, the university community. So for us, it was absolutely essential to be crystal clear on that. And uh, our commitment to that is really based on two principles. Our first principle, which we call open forum, is based on the, on the commitment that we want to create an environment where our students and our faculty can freely explore ideas, where they treat each other with respect, but where even the most complex and challenging issues can, dis can be discussed and can be explored freely. And it's our responsibility as leaders, uh, as faculty, to make sure that this happens in the classroom, but that it also happens outside the classrooms, in the residence halls, um, and wherever our students interact. So that's component number one, um, open forum. Uh, our fifth chance, Alexander Hurt, um, uh, said it memorably, you know, he, he said, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, is that our goal is we don't want to protect our students from ideas, and hopefully by creating an environment where they can explore that, they can have ideas on their own. Or to put it differently, our purpose is not to tell people what to think, but to help them to learn how to think, even about challenging and difficult issues. And then the second pillar, um, often not appreciated, but just as important is the pillar of principled neutrality. And uh, Alexander Hertz said that also in the early 1970s, he was very clear that the university should stay neutral on issues, political issues, uh, that do not affect the university directly. Um, so that means for us is that we want to exercise principled restraint on commenting on every issue of the day, even though these are important issues and people feel strongly about that, because we want to create an environment where our faculty and our students can freely discuss uh, these issues and explore them without being worried that they're going against the party line. That's an important thing, and it means for us as a university, and for me personally, is that uh, we want to make sure that we're not commenting on every policy issue under the sun, but that we want to make sure that we create an environment of maximal freedom for our faculty and for our students to engage in civil discourse. So overall, we're in great shape. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity here. Um, we are in a thriving community. For those of you 
uh, that haven't been back to Nashville, that haven't been back to campus in a while, um, I invite you to come back. For those of you that are parents of students, I invite you to visit and visit often. You'll be amazed um, of the changes that are going, going on at Vanderbilt and that are going on in Nashville. And it's utterly crucial for us to be an active part of that, to be a partner with the city, um, to engage um, with Nashville um, in a sense where we can bring our strength uh, to the forefront um, and our great partner for both the community, for the businesses here, for the nonprofits, um, and more broadly speaking, for the Nashville community overall. So I'm excited about what the future holds. Um, there will be more challenges. That's the nature um, of uh, being in a university. Um, but I couldn't be more happy on where we are and more optimistic about the future. So with that, Tim, I think we have time for some questions now, right? We certainly do. Thank you, Chancellor, for those insightful remarks. It was interesting to learn uh, about the present state of our university and its future. I would like now to jump into the Q&A session. We'll begin with questions that were pre-submitted during registration and take some of the live incoming questions. I encourage our audience members to use the Q&A feature on their screens to submit your que their questions and we'll try to reach as many as we can. Chancellor, as you approach the conclusion of your second year as Vanderbilt's ninth chancellor, what beyond rankings and other published praises regarding Vanderbilt has impressed you the most about our institution? So, there's a tremendous amount of momentum um, at Vanderbilt and um, I knew that uh, before I joined Vanderbilt as chancellor. Um, I had been impressed by what, what um, I had heard about Vanderbilt and um, really how it had, it had uh, taken advantage of opportunities um, and just uh, was very impressed uh, by the momentum um, and by the great progress that the university has made. What I didn't appreciate at the time was really what made Vanderbilt special. And what's amazing to me is we have this tremendous group of talented individuals, faculty, staff, students, postdocs, and they can work together. And they can work together really in a way that is part of one community. And so the sense of, I always call it radical collaboration, collaboration, by that I mean radical, you know, that in the word radical, uh, the, that's Latin and the word root is in there. And it means that it, it's not just something accidental, but it's really something that goes to a root that is critical on who we are. And I've been at other universities. This is my, this is my first university where I've been employed. I was at, um, at Northwestern, at Stanford, and the University of Chicago before. Then these are wonderful universities, but the sense of collaboration, of cooperation, of working together, of community, is really powerful. And the reason why this is so critical for us is it allows us to do things that others can't do. Um, because when you operate in silos, there are certain things that are just very difficult to pull off. I'll just to give you one example. We have a tremendous institute on surgery and engineering, um, which is a university-wide institute that is doing on surgical techniques, um, and uh, where surgeons and engineers, as the name says, would work together. Now, it is very, very difficult to create a structure where clinical faculty, faculty in medical school that deal with patients, would work together with engineers. And it's even more difficult to do that with surgeons. And it's impossible if you are at a university where the medical school is like three miles away. But even if it's adjacent, it's difficult because they have different models and they have different responsibilities. And there's a lot of reasons for why this shouldn't work but it works, and it works here. And it works to a level where this particular institute is among the very best in the world um, in developing path-breaking um, uh, new approaches to surgery based on, based on engineering solutions. That's an example because we can do things that others can't do. And there's a whole variety of other examples on the student side, on the faculty side, on the research side that are deeply rooted in our commitment to radical collaboration, our sense of being one community. What would you identify as our greatest challenge moving forward, particularly in light of how life has changed since March of 2020? I think our biggest challenge is maybe a little surprising, 
And people sometimes ask me, you know, so what, what keeps you awake at night? And there are, there's a whole list of things that we can think about. There's the political situation that we're dealing with. There is, a, yeah, I think, the sense of like a polarization that we have in the country. Um, these are very serious issues, and we need to be aware of them. We need to address them. We need to be engaged with them. But I would say that, that the thing that is my biggest, my biggest concern is that we do not set our aspirations high enough. So I think we are in a critical moment in Vanderbilt's history. Um, we, as I said, we have tremendous momentum. We are um, in a boom town um, that is you know, one of the fastest growing cities um, in the country. Um, you know, people want to live in Nashville. They want to come here. There's just so many things that are well aligned. And I think it's really important for us that we take full advantage of this critical moment and really set our aspirations high. And so if something worries me, it's that. It's that sometimes I'm a little concerned that we are not aspirational, not ambitious enough. And that comes back to um, something I said earlier. It's very important that we have confidence in who we are. That we're not trying to be like others, that we're not trying to copy others. Um, that is a that I think is, is important to be front and center and always, always aware of. And you know, historically, it wasn't always the case. I mean, Vanderbilt was known as the Harvard of the South. And that already has a reference to some other university in there. But we've outgrown that identity. And um, the students that now come to us come from all over the country. And students that come from the Northeast or from the Midwest or from California are not coming here because they want to be in the Harvard of the South. They're coming here because they're getting a great education, an education that really focuses on having them, or, or, of letting them grow as whole people in a great city where there's great, where there's great music. And then there's SEC athletics. You know, and there's so many things that are great about your education here. But it is something that is unique and that is very attractive to our students and it's very attractive to our faculty. And so we do not have to reference ourselves to others, even though these are very distinguished places. Thank you. Can you speak to us about the new university brand identity? Yeah. The reasoning behind the change, why now, and how the change propels us forward? Yes. So, 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 so uh, whenever we have changes in brand identities, uh, that steers strong emotions. And, uh, and, that's, and, and the presence of that and the reactions, that's a good sign. Because what that means is that people care. And what we did is as part of our overall thinking about the university, um, and it comes back to something I said before, you know, about being clear about our identity, there was a sense that we wanted to be more confident. We wanted to be more confident in how we talk about ourselves, uh, more confident in um, how we present ourselves, and, uh, and to be clear about what is it that makes Vanderbilt unique. And I talked about the sense of commitment that every one of our students and our faculty can realize their potential. If we don't, we don't um, prioritize one or the other, it's, you know, we're, I always say we go from Bach to baseball and everything in between. We love our chemical engineers, we love our musicians, we love our student athletes, and we want to put them in an environment where they can thrive, and we believe strongly that's a collaborative and cooperative environment. So that, that, once, that was clear. And then we wanted to express that visually. And um, when we did that, when we went through that process, we realized very quickly that there were some challenges with the existing um, brand and with the existing logos and with the existing visual identity. So for example, um, there, were like, there are three pieces of that. There's a seal. There is like a, there's a, there's a university which has the oak leaf in there. And then there was the star V, which was the athletics logo. The first problem was is that there was no connection, no visual connection between athletics and the university logo. And this was, this was a concern to us because we wanted to make sure that our student athletes and athletics feels as much part of the university as everything else. Um, Candice Lee, our athletic director, and I, we always say, there's no daylight between athletics and the rest of the university, or I've used that term many times, is that athletics is, much, is as much part of Vanderbilt as the law school. But visually, through our identity, that wasn't the case. 
So that was problem number one. Problem number two is that among these three expressions of the university, the only one that really was successful and that was where people felt an affinity was is the Star V, which is really our athletics logo. And the reason we know that is we looked at merchandise sales. And the only merchandise that we could see where people would wear a t-shirt or a hat was with the Star V. Nobody, there was basically no sales of t-shirts, hats, or anything like that um, with, the, with the Oak Leaf logo. So even though people say, well, we like it, it's nice, but they, they don't wear it on their t-shirt. And that's a problem. It's not because of the sales, that's not the point, but the point is it's a sign that people are, have an affinity towards the Star V, but they didn't have an affinity with respect to the other parts of our visual identity. And these were totally unconnected. So that, that's, that was problematic. So what we thought about is like, how do we, how do we kind of a confident, um, a confident um, visual identity that's reflective of who we are, that is unique, and that is common across universities, and that not different parts of the university feel left out. So the challenge is it needed to be common, but it also needed to be flexible enough. And so our sense was is that it had to be focused on the V itself, the Vanderbilt V. And then the question was, how exactly do you do that? And how do you do it in athletics? And how do you do it in athletics content? So those are the details, and that's kind of the craftsmanship of getting this done. But we were, we were, we were really doubling down on that. We wanted to have one component, one visual identity that clearly identifies a Vanderbilt. And um, you can, you, if you think about right, the most successful visual um, identities of that among our peers, if I give you like a red hat with an H, you know, you know what that stands for, that's Harvard. Or I give you a blue hat with a Y, you know, that's Yale. And I give you a slightly different red hat with an S, you know, that's Stanford. And the combination of the black and the gold and the V uniquely um, symbolizes Vanderbilt. And so we want to have that level of um, recognition, that level of clarity, and that drove our decision. So it was a long process. And um, it led to our, our new visual identity. Can you share the university's priorities in terms of how to connect alumni with the university and also how alumni and parents can be most helpful to Vanderbilt? It's a great question. It's a, it's a critical question for us. And um, I would say that um, uh, we, need to do, we need to do better on that. So there are, as you know, I've been very positive about uh, what I said about Vanderbilt, I'm very positive um, about the potential of the university, but there are also certain things that need to, we need to improve. I just gave you one example, which was the visual identity. Uh, there are other aspects, uh, for example, um, our support for athletics in the facilities there that are not at the level where they need to be. And I think another aspect is just that are really how do we create, how do we work together with our alums and with our parents? And the way we think about this is really driven by uh, the same concept that I mentioned before is that we're one community. And that means for alums, we want our alums to be Vanderbilt for life. We want them to be connected with us all the way through. And we want our parents to feel part of the Vanderbilt community as well. So what does it mean to be part of the Vanderbilt community? Well, we're very, you know, it's, it's very important to us that when you join this community, you feel welcome and you feel a sense of belonging. Secondly, we want to be committed to your growth and to realizing your potential. We do that really well for our students, but we're not doing it well enough for alumni. So an important part of that for us is to have, be more intentional about um, our, the development needs of our alumni and how do we foster that. And then the third piece, very important for us, is the sense of people giving back and contributing to the community. And th this, is a, this is a crucial piece at Vanderbilt. And that is certainly something that our students do when they are on campus. I just want to give you one quick example of that, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the original question. But um, the parents know that. When you drive to Vanderbilt now, and you drop off your kids at Vanderbilt, and for those of you that have been in this situation, um, particularly your first child, I remember this well, these are very emotional moments, right? Oh my god, they're leaving home. How's that going to work out? 
um, for the kids, it's like they have a sense of excitement, but there are also some concerns. Will I make friends? Was that the right decision? So there are these big thoughts, and then there are, oh my God, where am I going to find parking, and will the bed sheets fit? So there's the trivial and the big all at the same time, and it's, it's intense, it's, it, but it's also challenging and it can be stressful. So the way we do this is when you drop off uh, your son or your daughter at our residence halls and you turn the corner, there are hundreds of our students that welcome you. And they don't just welcome you, they cheer, they clap, and then they help to bring your stuff inside the residence halls. So they have been there since 6 o'clock, and they get coffee and a free T-shirt, and you come in there, and it feels like a NASCAR pit where everybody converges on the car, grab your stuff, and saying, hey, I'm Bill, you're Emily, where do you live? And the experience of that is profound because people experience that, and they say, this will be fine. And they feel from the very first moment that they're part of the community. Now, last year was the first time that I experienced that. And these are our sophomores usually that do that. And there are hundreds of them. They're not paid. They're getting a cup of coffee and a T-shirt. And it was so moving to me as I was there. It was raining. <laughs> and, you know, they were there and cheering anyway. Those sophomores didn't have the experience because we couldn't do it during COVID. That's the experience that our students have on campus. And now we need to think about this on the alumni side. So I want our alumni and our parents to think about full members of the community and ask yourself, what can you contribute? So what is that? How can I support the university? Financially, we love that, but also um, with things that help us, that help our students or that help each other. So if, for example, uh, it's very, very valuable for us to have internships or to have career opportunities um, that our alums and our parents can provide um, to our students. So, so e even if you know, you're not at a stage in your life where you know, philanthropically uh, this is something that is, you want to engage at this point, but being a mentor, providing an internship, um, speaking at a class, right, being connected with a student club, all these things matter and can be enormously valuable. And then the second thing I think is be an ambassador. Talk about Vanderbilt. Talk about what makes Vanderbilt unique. Um, how, you know, how your experience was. Um, why Vanderbilt is such a special place. So, for example, uh, it's very, very valuable for us to have uh, alums or Vanderbilt parents to talk about prospective, prospective students and prospective parents share their perspective because we want to make sure that the, that the families, the students, um, that for whom Vanderbilt is the right choice know it, and they, and they trust people that are, you know, that are, have been in the same relations, in the same situation like them earlier, uh, they trust them. And so being an ambassador uh, is enormously valuable for us. And we're still, you know, we're still up there. We're now, we're well known and we're a hot school in New York and in Boston and in California, but the more we spread the word, the more um, we are becoming a destination um, for, uh, for, the, for the very best students and, uh, uh, that, that really can benefit from a Vanderbilt education. Can you please comment on the current financial strength of the very important Opportunity Vanderbilt program? Was the university able to successfully meet financial aid need of those facing hardships during the pandemic? Yes, I'm very proud of our commitment to financial aid. Um, Opportunity Vanderbilt is our signature program um, for undergraduates on that. And what that means basically is that um, everyone that is that applies to Vanderbilt will be accepted to Vanderbilt irrespective of the financial needs of their family. And, um, and they can graduate from Vanderbilt debt-free. Um, that is our commitment. That is one of the most generous um, and most successful and most well-designed financial aid programs in the country. Um, it, is, it, it has been transformative um, for the university. Um, and. Um, when you look back, when Opportunity Vanderbilt was really launched, I think it's one of the, one of the proudest moments in the history of Vanderbilt. So we, were, we totally were committed um, throughout um, the pandemic to Opportunity Vanderbilt. In addition, what we also realized is that there were hardships. And uh, so when there were particular hardships for our students, um, we, would, we would step in and support them. Um, but uh, we, are, we are totally committed that um, a fi the financial limitation should never be a limitation for our students to go to Vanderbilt and thrive here. 
What do you think the future of higher education will be, particularly given the costs and what we've learned through the pandemic about remote learning? Yeah, so, um, so two, two related issues. One is the cost and one is the one remote learning side. So on the cost of that, um, and this comes back to the opportunity Vanderbilt side, um, it's sometimes people, I think, um, it's, it's difficult to understand exactly how this works. And well, when we look at net tuition, which is basically, that's what we're asking um, our families to contribute on average. Uh, so the net tuition, um, after you subtract all financial aid and all support, over the last uh, decade, 12 years, has been flat. Okay, so um, there has been, if you look at, uh, if you, if you, if you um, look at it in real dollars, there has been no change at all. And, um, and now that's a proud commitment. That we were very proud of that is that we that we were able to do that and and I think people need to realize is um, is is you know the tremendous the tremendous um, how how expensive it is to put a uh, an a, an education such as Vanderbilt's together so. We try, to, we try to do this through financial aid, but this is, this is a big resource commitment for us as a university. <coughs> and we are extremely grateful for every one of our alums and other supporters, parents that help us to maintain that level of financial aid and financial commitment and to support our faculty to do their path-breaking work. But uh, don't look at, at the kind of the, you know, the, the, the tuition numbers and the sticker price, if you will. The really critical question is, at least that's the way we think about it. What is it that our families contribute um, to, their, to their kids' education? And that particular piece has been flat um, uh, over more than the last decade. Um, and then the question is about, um, about uh, uh, technology, online learning, and so forth. So this has been a really interesting experience for us. And um, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but not too much. Um, one, of the, one of the most unexpected lessons from the pandemic was that our students are desperate to be together in person, and our faculty were surprisingly comfortable teaching online. Surprisingly comfortable. If I had told you three years ago that the 18-year-old that grew up with a cell phone, digital native, TikTok and Instagram, they are the ones that want to be together in person, while the 65-year-old history professor is perfectly comfortable teaching to Zoom, you would have laughed at me and you said, like, absolutely not. So the lesson for us is that, number one, the value of a residential education as we're providing has been reinforced. And uh, we know this you know, by just the tremendous gratitude that our students had to be together in person, how valuable this was and how much this was part of the educational experience. But the fact that we've learned that our faculty are comfortable teaching online opens up now new opportunity for us, for example, to engage with our alums. So previously, if you wanted to have faculty members engage with alums three years ago, you know, you would have to fly to an alumni chapter, wherever it is, in Dallas or New York, have an event, and that's it. Now, we can do this remotely because everybody has had the experience of being on Zoom together, and, you know, we may not love it, but it works. And so that allows us to rethink lifelong engagement with our alums and actually with our parents as well in a totally new way. So that's what we're thinking about right now. And I think that's where the real opportunity is. Um, for, for a university like Vanderbilt, um, there will always be new technologies that will, that will be integrated, will be used. But the, the, the surprising but profound lesson um, from, the pandemic has, from the pandemic has been the reinforcement of the value of a residential college education. Thank you for explaining that. And our next question, our audience wants to know what Vanderbilt is doing to support student mental health and well-being. Yeah, this, of course, was the greatest challenge, arguably, uh, during, the, during the pandemic. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's a serious issue. Um, we see this all across the country. Um, the, um, the, the challenges that came through 
uh, the pandemic, especially it, especially when you were in a, when you were in a place where there was hardly any in-person instruction or hardly any in-person interaction, is profound. We're worried about that. Um, my fellow presidents and chancellors are worried about that, and we have certainly seen an uptake in uh, mental health challenges, mental health crisis, and demand for mental health uh, 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 mental health programs and support. So um, we have a terrific dean of students. His name is GL Black. He's one of the national leaders um, on mental health. And we have an integrated care network that basically is like a one stop where students can go and get all the variety of different cares, whether that's a support group or a check in or, you know, if they need to be um, connected with a therapist. So we really like uh, what we're doing there. The next step for us is, is to make sure that our students really take advantage of that. So another way to say this is, we know that once we have, once, it's, once we're connected with the students and we know that the student has challenges and they're kind of part, they're part of the system, we do well. When things, what we're very worried about are for our students that kind of drift off. And that, and that is particularly true for students that live off campus and may not be connected. So our next step for us is to almost have like a, you know, kind of a sense of like, I don't want to call it first aid, but where are where, where people that have contact with students that are not mental health experts, faculty, staff, can spot when there are trouble areas and then be an active supporter of that. That, for, that I think, is the next step um, for us to um, enhance our uh, ability to help students that have mental health challenges, and we're actively working on that. We appreciate everything that the university is doing to support our students. Moving on to the next question, can you speak to the university's international strategy? And what do you see as Vanderbilt's role in the global landscape? Yeah, this is a great question. And um, uh, this is something that uh, I think is a, is a real goal for us post-pandemic to think through carefully. Um, the, the, the Vanderbilt hasn't really focused on a global strategy. I mean, we have study abroad. That works well. Our students really like it. We have international students on campus. We have a lot of international faculty. Um, that's great. But the question is, how can we do more? Um, the real challenge to a global strategy at this point is that um, the strategy that most universities have pursued uh, look like very difficult to continue. And for most universities, 80% of global strategies meant China. Uh, that's not working anymore. So um, I think we all, every university right now, is thinking through what are the lessons from COVID and what are the lessons from um, this experience um, with online and what does this really mean for a global strategy? So um, that's not anything that we have fully developed at this point. We wanted to wait kind of really until it's clear how this whole, all of this shakes out during COVID, but it's certainly something that, we, that we're gonna tackle. Actually, our goal is to tackle that in the next year and it is something where we need to do more. Following up on that, being a diverse international university, how does Vanderbilt strive to retain its connection to the Nashville and greater Tennessee community? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. And um, I, think, I think, first of all, there is a really close alignment in values and in culture between Vanderbilt and Nashville. Um, Nashville, for those of you that know it well, for those of you that are alums, of course you know it very well, uh, is a warm, a welcoming, community that is full of creative people. And you know, people come to Nashville for decades because they want to realize their dream. And whether that is in the music, or whether that is building a business, or starting a restaurant, or a coffee shop, this is a place where people come. Um, they, want to, they want to do what they have to do. They're driven by that. And, and it's a welcoming place. It's a place that, 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 that cherishes that and that's open and warm. And that is true of Vanderbilt as well. I think that the, the, the issue for us will be, how do we, how do we stay in alignment um, with the city as the city is growing so dramatically? So there's some practical questions. Um, we have now, um, Amazon is bringing 7,000 people um, to Nashville. That's what they call that headquarter three, you know, which a lot of them are engineers in the data analytics space. 
Oracle is building a campus on the other side of the Cumberland River, 12,000, 13,000 people. Again, a lot of engineers, a um, lot of digital talent that will come to Nashville. How do we think about this from the point of view of Vanderbilt? How do we collaborate with these new, very important parts of the Nashville economy? Nashville traditionally has been you know, known for, um, for its, its strength in healthcare, healthcare management, um, of course, the music industry, uh, and a couple of others, but uh, Nashville is changing. And so I think it's important for us to, we don't want to lose who we are. We don't want to lose our soul. And this city has a soul and this university has a soul, and they're aligned. But the really interesting question for us is how do we stay connected with that? And one very important way in which this can be done is through engagement with the communities. And there are lots of challenges that Nashville is facing, and we want to be a partner in that. For example, we, have a, we just have a new partnership with Metro Public Schools to Peabody uh, that's working about like, uh, educational inequities. Um, very, very, very promising new program. And we work with the city on sustainability and, and transportation, all sorts of things. But one thing where we can particularly play an important role, I think, is in help grow and catalyze Nashville's entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem. And um, I mentioned that's very strong in healthcare management, that's very strong uh, in, in music and, and entertainment. But for example, they, we have a way to go in the biomedical side. We have a, one of the world's great uh, medical schools, we have one of the world's great medical centers, there's a tremendous amount of talent here, but we need to, we can do more on that. So, um, and this is not just a, this is not just a minor, a nice to have for us as a university. Um, this, is, this is essential for us to, to be as preeminent as we are and perhaps even become, kind of write the next chapter in Vanderbilt's history. So I'm going to say something maybe a little provocative, but I think it's very unlikely that a university will be a great university in the next 10 years, 10 years from now, if they don't have a thriving innovation ecosystem around them. And the reason for that is that our students and our faculties want to do that. They want to be engaged. Many of them want to be engaged in entrepreneurial activity. Um, they want to be part of, a, of, an, of an innovation, of a, of a vibrant innovation ecosystem. And if we don't provide that for them, we're going to have difficulties in attracting the very best faculty and the very best students. So we're all over that. We're working hard at that. Um, this will be a major focus for us um, over the, not only this year, but over the next couple of years. And uh, we want to be a real force for helping develop this particular um, innovation ecosystem in Nashville. Can you share some of the top areas of new or expanded focus for research and faculty? Yeah, so um, what Destination Vanderbilt really was, um, Destination Vanderbilt was a pretty bold move at the time. So we announced that in the fall um, of uh, 2020, and the way this works on higher education, there's budgeting every year, it usually happens in the spring, and then you budget for your year, how many faculty do you hire, where do you invest, and so forth. And so we and our peers were in budgeting season in April 2020, when the bottom fell out. And it's hard to overstate how devastating this was for universities from a financial point of view. We had the public health crisis, of course, but it was from a financial point of view. Our endowment lost like 25, 30% of its value, so did all of our peers. We were worried about grant revenue. We were very worried, for those of us that have academic medical centers, those were shut down. And then whenever the economy suffers, the demand for financial aid goes up as well. So every aspect of our financial model was under serious distress. And so as a consequence of that, we, we believed that, our, that everybody was hurting. And so that meant then nobody was hiring people. Nobody was hiring faculty. But when we thought about it, we said, like, well, everybody is hurting, but we will hard hurt less. And the reason why we will hurt less is because of the great work by my predecessor, uh, Nicholas Zeppers, and then intern Shams Laventi. Uh, we, had, we were in a strong financial position. We had reserves. And we could basically say, well, if nobody is hiring great faculty, we will hire them because they're available. So we had an imbalance between the supply and demand of talent, and we thought this is a once-in-a-lifetime once opportunity to bring new talent to Vanderbilt. And we did it in two ways. We did it across the board. So if the law school 
wanted to hire one person, we would say, if you have three terrific people because your competitors are not hiring this year, hire three, and we as the chan from the chancellor's office will support you for the next five years, and then it kind of peters down, and then you'll take over. So we'll basically, it's like loading up on, on the first round draft choices, right? That's what we're going to do. And then in other areas, we said, this is the opportunity for us to grow. So I mentioned computer science, where we need to grow. And, uh, and we did that very successfully because we were the only ones or one of the very few in the market at that time and were able to attract great talent for us. So there are certain areas where we want to continue to do that, but we always, want to, we always want to make sure that we get better across the board. So one example, Destination Vanderbilt faculty, which are at the very top of their field, the Blair School of Music was able to hire three great faculty members. One of them is Dominic Barton, who is one of the leading baritones of his generation and came to Vanderbilt already having won three Emmys. And one of the things that we didn't, that, that was particularly gratifying, is that um, Destination Vanderbilt also allowed us to increase the diversity of our faculty um, because um, we were able to be an attractive place for, for faculty from diverse backgrounds. So, you know, Dominic Barton is African American, one of the leading, as I said, one of the leading baritones of his generation. So that helped make the faculty at Blair more diverse as well. So, um, so it's speci in specific areas, particularly I mentioned computer science as one example, there are a couple of others, and then also look for opportunities where we can become a destination for the best faculty um, in the world across the board. And this is the final question, Chancellor. A question from a parent that I think is a good chance to talk about alumni engagement. How is Vanderbilt helping students find internships and jobs? Are there ways for current students to easily connect with alumni who may have jobs or internships available? So we have a, we have a you know, well-developed career service center. Uh, that's, uh, we brought actually somebody new in because we want to expand that and we want to do more on that. Uh, Alex Sevilla, who, uh, who uh, joined us um, nine months ago now, and uh, this, is a critical, this is critical. So traditional career centers in many universities, and Vanderbilt included in that, really focused on helping students find their path, find their passion. And that's hugely important. But we also need to make sure that they can find a job. And that means providing them with opportunities, internships, jobs, and that's where alumni and parents are really critical. So the easiest way to get involved with that is just to directly contact our career center. I mentioned uh, Alex Sevilla's name, easy to find. And uh, just, hey, I want to be involved with that. I'd love to do that. You know, and uh, and uh, we, we'd love mentors. We'd love internships. We love job opportunities. We'd love if people say, hey, uh, I, I had a successful career in, in film. I had a successful career in venture capital, and I'd love to have a little, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to tell people about it. We can set up a, a Zoom call uh, with like, you know, 30, 40 students that are interested in that. How do I get into that industry? All of that is welcome. As I said before, um, we, we are one community, and we love it when people contribute to that community, particularly if they have a particular, if they have an area of expertise um, that they can share um, with our students and with each other. Thank you, Chancellor. We very much appreciate the, um, uh, the time that you've given us tonight. Uh, wish, we could con wish we could continue further, but we're at the end of our time today. I'm certain our audience has enjoyed hearing from you as much as I have, and we've gained insight into your plans for the future of our university. The Alumni Association appreciates all that you do to keep us engaged and informed. Uh, a recording of this session will be available for later viewing. Thank you all for joining us and all that you do on behalf of Vanderbilt. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.